Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm John Lovett. I'm Tommy Vitor. <laughs> well, what's the... I don't know. We're all back together in the studio again. It's nice. Oh, yeah. Is this our not, for... not for a while well, because you, we had COVID. We had COVID and I wasn't and allowed in. in New York. And then I wasn't allowed in the York. studio once because yeah. I was dancing between the raindrops. <laughs> right. Right. Now we're all here, Tommy and I, with our super immunity. Amelia, um, Amelia had COVID. Oh, oh yeah. Amelia's here. She had... We're all super sort immune. Sort of tore through the office. Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah. Anyway, you guys don't need to hear this. Uh... <laughs> On today's show, Trump is headed for a big loss in Georgia, but Trumpism may still prevail on Tuesday. New data offers some hopeful signs about Democratic enthusiasm and voting. And later, Congresswoman Karen Bass stops by Crooked HQ to talk about her campaign to be the next mayor of Los Angeles. Love it. Just recorded the interview. It's a good conversation. Fantastic. We, mean, we even managed to get to the CIA and crack. See, oh. even if you're Which not I a Los was... Angeles resident, this is an interview you want to hear. And I was surprised. I was surprised we got there. Let's get to the news. Uh, we got another big set of primaries this week in Texas, Alabama, Arkansas, Minnesota, and Georgia, which features maybe the biggest race with possibly the most predictable outcome. Uh, the polls show incumbent Governor Brian Kemp leading former Senator David Perdue by an average of 23 points uh, in every single poll in Georgia since April has Kemp over 50% which would allow him to clinch the nomination without a runoff. Uh, Kemp is, of course, at the very top of Donald Trump's enemies list for refusing to overturn the 2020 election, uh, which is why the former president has spent a couple million dollars to help Purdue. But the Republican Governors Association has spent $5 million of their own to help Kemp. Uh, and they have been somewhat fairly bragging uh, that they've already protected incumbent governors from Trump-endorsed challengers in Nebraska and Idaho. Uh and just to twist the knife, Mike Pence campaigned with Brian Kemp on Monday, which led to Trump's spokesman accusing the former vice president of being, quote, desperate to chase his lost relevance. Mm. If some of those Trump supporters had gotten their way, they'd have twisted the knife and Mike Pence would be dead because <laughs> they wanted to kill him. They wanted to kill him at the Capitol. I mean, but like desperate to chase his lost relevance, like did, my first question is like, can you lose something that you never really had? Yeah, how <laughs> how much relevance like, does a community theater Reagan impersonator <laughs> start with? Hey, you guys want to hear? Um, you guys want to hear every Pence voter in the world screaming all at the same time? Was that it? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> he, Mike Pence, kind of lives in the like the uncanny valley of humanity. You know, he's just like a, some dignity and emotion and a little bit of courage away Look, from being a human. Just for pure political analysis here, like <laughs> Mike, Mike, you know. Because, like, right, Mike Pence did the right thing by not overturning the election, even though he had a ceremonial-only role in counting the electoral votes. Good for Mike Pence. But, like, the idea that Mike Pence is going to run for president in 2024 is so laughable to me. Like, where is... We've I love been it. We've talked for so long. But like, I love is it, there Trump. is there a space for, like, a non-Trump candidate in 24? Good debate to have. Is that non-Trump candidate Mike Pence? <laughs> what? Who who can make an argument for Mike Pence in that role? Anyone? Can well, you guys make an argument? I remember a couple months ago, he did his first little rebuke yeah. of Trump. And I took that as a sign that, of course, he can't be running because you can't just be Trump except on the three things his voters care most about. doesn't make any sense. I think but, even if that fa- even if the, the, the concern about 2020 like fades from you know, the top spot in Trump voter concerns. Like, you can't be all, I was part of the Trump administration and I loved everything we did except that little thing at the end there. <laughs> no one likes Mike Pence when he was chosen for the That's job, except saying. for a small subset of evangelicals somewhere in Indianapolis. He took it right. to get out of losing an election in Indiana. He is the Which lucky- is what Trump said. That's yes. Trump spokesman Which, said. And it's absolutely true. He had no constituency. It, the job went to him because I, he was one of the people that would say yes at a time in which everyone assumed Donald Trump was going to lose because they did, people didn't understand that we lived in hell. All right. We, we know what- we probably just talked about Mike Pence more than America will over the next four more years. More than Karen Pence has <laughs> talked about him. Um, why do you guys think Brian Kemp is on his way to such a big victory in the Georgia primary, Tommy? First of all, Trump told the Washington Post that he heard that Purdue is surging. So I just think <laughs> <laughs> I just think we need to have some balance here. Yeah, he did. From uh, Trafalgar or whatever. He, he, did, a, he, did, a, he did an interview. 
Um, so, I, like, you know, everyone's like, well, what does this mean for Trump's endorsement? We'll get to that later. But I do think that endorsements matter most when it's sort of an open field or, or less well-known candidates. Incumbency is powerful. These voters know <coughs> Kemp. Trump endorsed Kemp back in the day. Trump fights every culture war battle he can find. But he also has an actual record as a governor that he talks about all the time. So he talks about education. He talks about inflation. If you're mad about the 2020 election being stolen, uh, even though Trump is pissed at him about that, Kemp says, well, I passed the Election Integrity Act of 2021, which made Democrats really, really mad, which is all you need to know about it. Yeah, and tri- so, triangulating on democracy. Yeah. And so like, Kemp's not out there criticizing Trump ever. You can be pro-Trump and pro-Kemp and, and vote for them. And so ultimately, I think that uh, Georgia voters are the most nervous about beating Stacey Abrams. And David Purdue is just a absolute loser. He sucks at politics. He's bad at debates. He can't raise money. He's running an ineffective campaign. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned Nebraska, Idaho, and Georgia as places where Trump's endorsement isn't getting him very far. Those were also three candidates who were terrible in different ways. There was McGeehan in Idaho, who was most famous for- No, it's pronounced McGeehan. McGeehan? I believe it's pronounced McGeehan. There's McGeehan in Idaho. name off. No, you know what? Don't fix it in in post. Don't fix it. We'll find out. Tweet Uh, out. I believe it's pronounced McGeehan uh, in Idaho, who's most famous for uh, pretending to be governor when the governor tried to go on vacation. Oh, that was hilarious. That was a funny episode. So she's a loon. Less funny was her posing with them. Some white nationalists in a picture, the and then and then refusing and then, to and then apologize, the, uh, and then the militia. No, she spoke at a white national event. She posed with the militia. <laughs> it's it's tough to keep what, keep track of it. Why do all the militias end up out there? It's there in Oregon, and I then space, I guess. Anyway, love you. are saying, <laughs> and then Nebraska was a groper uh, uh, guy, who yeah. didn't have the endorsement of the current governor, and then. Purdue, man, this guy has, seems to have no interest in politics. Nebraska, like Ricketts, Governor Ricketts has kind of a machine out there that Trump went against and didn't work. But I also think so Kemp is doing Trumpism without Trump, right? So in addition to signing the voter suppression bill, which he brags about, Tommy just mentioned, this year alone, he signed bills that let you carry a gun without a license, uh, criminalize most abortions, and prevent teachers from talking about race or LGBT issues, right? So he is like doing all the Trumpy, and and not just Kemp. This goes to your point, Levitt, too. Like part of it is the bad candidates that Trump is endorsing in these specific races, but also in none of these races where Trump uh, Trump's candidates are losing, like you don't see the candidate who's winning opposing Trump in any way. Yeah, they're, they're, they're they're not not, running, it's not Susan Collins and Mitt Romney. They're not They're not criticizing Trump. They're just trying to ignore Trump. I mean, and, and Kemp himself apparently said to reporters recently about Trump, he's like, I'm not mad at him. He's just mad at me. It's very sad. Oh my, <laughs> it's like, that, which is so sad. That rules. <laughs> I'm not mad at him. He's yeah. just mad at me and there's nothing I can do. But honestly, I think that is, if he wins today, which it seems like he's going to, um, like, that's the model for them, right? Like, you don't have to necessarily... You can win by not criticizing Trump, but be as Trumpy as possible. No one out there is... Win- like you said, no one out there is winning by being Susan Collins or or Mitt Romney or Adam Kinzinger or Liz Cheney. N- no one's no. winning like that. Um, do you think that Brian Kemp saying, I can't control how Trump feels, I can only control how I feel, means that he's one of the therapy boys? Mm. <laughs> That's a good Do we think Brian Kemp... a real swerve to get a therapy Brian, boys in. Brian, do you think Brian Kemp <laughs> may be a therapy boy? I don't know. Could be. I hope so. Maybe it's a secret weapon. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think I think it's not. This isn't about like an anti-Trump thing. This is about Republicans trying to go beyond Trump. This yeah. is what they're all trying to do. It's a very yeah. and look, it's 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 a hard space. It's a difficult space to occupy <laughs> because Trump's always out there about to attack you. But you know, if you uh, if you just tell people that you think, uh, you know, the 2020 election was bullshit, but you don't want to focus on it. And then you do a bunch of other extremely right wing things. You could probably survive without Trump's endorsement. Yeah. And you look at like DeSantis as well. And there is there's so much power in the perch of being a governor that you can kind of shape your own narrative. You can control media cycles. You can, you know, demonstrate you can you can pick fights with the left. You can pick fights with the media in a way that's pretty effective. Again, I just I want to stress it once again that David Perdue absolutely sucks. No, yeah. that's very a important. Yeah. It, it, it's a weekend at Bernie's campaign. He can't raise money. He can't. He doesn't work hard. It Trump like complains that he's in it lazy. at all. What yeah. are you doing? If you, if I was a rich guy, I would just go be a rich guy. Go be a rich guy and don't. You're a loser who lost. That's everyone. That's what voters think. Just go have fun. Now go that we now that we've said all this, uh, when Kemp wins, can yeah. we still say like uh, the narrative is about Trump as a loser? Well, is I that flagged okay? that he was surging. <laughs> Pretty surging. <laughs> Because I still want to, hey, how, John, how can, much is this race about Trump? I mean, think? we can do whatever we want. It is 2022. You tell whatever story makes you feel good. Just in uh, the next five seconds, but, just change like that. But here's yeah. the key. I mean, I think Georgia primary voters will probably tell you that this race is about beating Stacey Abrams. 
Donald Trump makes everything about himself, so that's what the media narrative is going to be. He dumped $2.64 million of his own PAC money into the state. He recruited Purdue to run. He's done rallies in the state. He's doing a teletown hall tonight. <laughs> like, what? that's such a half ass thing, a teletown hall. Isn't that hall. what he did with Youngkin at the end, too? Yep. Yeah, yeah. He should he should have he should have gone there. <laughs> yeah. With Yunkin, he, that was the yeah, he was a little worried Yunkin was gonna lose. But Chris Christie's out there, you know, doing a weird victory lap on on all this stuff for the RGA and talking about how they're defending incumbents and they spent five million dollars they should have spent against Democrats. But Christie was quoted somewhere saying that this was the number one most important race for Trump. And like he's a guy who would know. And the most and the and the good thing about all of this is uh in a race against Stacey Abrams, this could be decided by a very, very small margin. And at those small margins, as we learned when Warnock and Ossoff wins, enough demoralization, enough Trump nonsense and noise and distraction can make a difference. Yeah, that's true. Uh, the other important Republican primary in Georgia where Trump may prevail is the very close Secretary of State race between Brad Raffensperger, who famously certified Biden's win in Georgia after rejecting Trump's attempt to overturn the election, and State Representative Jody Heiss, who will have the power to certify or decertify future elections in Georgia. Uh, Heiss is just one of many state-level candidates Trump has endorsed because he hopes they'll help him steal the 2024 election if necessary. Uh, here's a quote from a New York Times piece over the weekend. Quote, in an interview with the Times, Mr. Trump acknowledged that in deciding whom to endorse in state legislative races, he's looking for candidates who want state legislatures to have a say in naming presidential electors, a position that could let politicians... <laughs> I'm like laughing at this line. A politician that could a, po a position that could let politicians short circuit the democratic process and override the popular vote. Yeah, you think overturning the election would be short circuiting the democratic process? Yeah, yeah, yeah that, could happen. that could happen. Democracies hate this one weird trick. <laughs> <laughs> find out what it is um the times piece also analyzed just how many republican state legislators were willing to discredit or overturn the 2020 election uh anything surprise you guys or stay with you from that analysis Tommy? i mean there's just a lot of them 357 <laughs> sitting republican legislators in battleground states only have tried to uh overturn or have talked about overturning the election 44 percent of lawmakers in nine states 22 percent actively tried to delay the vote or overturn the election, 11% wanted to send an alternate slate of electors. So, you know, pretty bad. Pretty fucking pretty bad. Pretty deep in infection. Here's in what stuck out with me. Here. Like, you hear 44% of Republican legislators in the battleground states voted to either overturn or discredit the election. And you're like, that's a lot. But that number actually sort of undercounts how many did because <coughs> it takes into account Texas, Florida, and North Carolina, where Trump won. So in those states... There wasn't a lot of Republicans who did it just because exactly. they didn't have to. They didn't have to if care. If you look at, I didn't realize how, Pennsylvania is actually the most dangerous state of all this because it was basically almost 100% of Republican legislators in the state of Pennsylvania uh, were in this category. I think Arizona is the same. Arizona was close, yeah. yeah. Arizona comes in second, but Pennsylvania was like very fucking alarming. Just a brief aside, uh, sort of separate news cycle today was that Kellyanne Conway has a book coming out. Who gives a shit? No one's going to read it. Apparently just sort of... You know, Dan's in stiff competition with her. Oh, don't buy it. Um, <laughs> but it's mean to Jared Kushner, so mm, point for Kellyanne. Oh, no, no. But going to buy it. <laughs> apparently the book starts with an anecdote where Kellyanne Conway takes a call from, you know, now anti-Trump whatever anti-maga guy michael cohen where they are trying to fix the iowa straw poll and trying to get kellyanne conway to do it for them so you know election rigging has been part of their dna uh, well, they, hey i'll beginning. take straw poll rigging any day that's the, fine i mean look it's it's it, <laughs> it's, it's such a joke i mean the, the it took it took him a day to accuse his uh former aide's husband of rigging the vote because because oz was uh, uh, behind a bit in early counts in Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah. He accused uh, Ted Cruz of fixing a vote in Iowa. Like, it's not partisan. It's whoever... I mean, it is partisan because he's... But did he? But did he? But he did he. Yeah, Ted but though, the... Um, there's only, you know, there's only two kinds of elections. There's uh, legitimate ones, Republicans won, win, and illegitimate ones, the Democrats won. That's right. I will say that the Times piece and the Secretary of State race in Georgia and some of what's been written about it just it made me realize how, like... I think that people. I think most voters don't understand how critical these state level elections are. And there were some focus groups that people did in Georgia, uh, where everyone, of course, heard of Kemp versus Purdue, and everyone knows Stacey Abrams. But a lot of voters just hadn't heard of Raffensperger and right. Jody Heiss. No one was paying attention. And so, th like, this is what happens: is you sort of sleepwalk into these state legislative candidates that Trump endorsed winning who have like now promised to overturn an election and it's really fucking scary and in states like Pennsylvania and Arizona 
it's actually really close to them having a majority of people who would actually do something bad. Now, the, the only good news in this piece, I counted this for good news, is mm. so they have like vote to, they have either tried to discredit or overturn. Only 11% supported sending alternate slates of electors, which is, of course, the nightmare scenario. But that's still, again, in Pennsylvania, it it's was getting lot. up. In Pennsylvania and Arizona, two states where there's a lot of Republicans in the legislature, it's getting up there. It's getting close to a moment where, so this is, it's not even a question of like, if at this point it's 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 when Republicans have critical mass in these legislatures to actually send a different state <clears throat> of electors and cause a constitutional crisis. Yeah, it's a huge problem. It's and it's scary. why and it's why people need to pay attention to state elections so much. You know. Yeah, and I do think our hope now has to be to figure out how to tell a story that ties their delegitimizing of democracy and the refusal to allow people to make their voices heard to what's happening on abortion because they are connected. It's only a group of people that believe they won't be held accountable by voters that believes they can uh, slowly unravel basic rights, which they're doing in schools, which they're doing to trans kids, which which they're doing to teachers, uh, which they're now going to do to to um, to women. And like I we we have been talking about our inability to convince people to focus on the threats to our democracy and this like puerile debate we have over and over again about we need to talk about kitchen table issues but we also need to talk about democracy why don't people care how do we make them care but i do think choice and abortion is the is the issue that has unlocked this broader debate about freedom and democracy and and if we can tie those things together we can hopefully prevent them from picking up the seats that they otherwise were on on track to get in november i also think on the threat to democracy we have to talk about it as a future threat and not past because, you know, Greg Sargent just had a piece about this today in the Washington Post. David Binder, who worked for Obama, did a bunch of focus groups. And the more you talk to voters about January 6th and what happened in 2020 and the big lie, people just see it as something that happened in the past. And they think that you're partisan talking about it. When you start talking about we need to make sure in the future that people do not have the power to overturn the will of the voters, then people's ear that that's what they care about. Even Republican primaries don't really want to talk about the past election. I mean, the, the CBS national poll uh, of Republicans found that 52 percent of Republicans want nominees to focus on loyalty, loyalty to Trump. Forty four percent want them to focus on discussing the 2020 election. Like they're not even that jazzed up about relitigating the past. We ha- and, and, you know, that's one thing. You know, we'll talk plenty about the January 6th hearings, but they really have to make sure those hearings are framed as we are here today to talk about future threats of democracy and how to prevent them and not to like relive January 6th over and over again. Yeah. In the same way, you know, in the same way, you know, Tommy, I know you're you're just like beating the drum about Jared Kushner's just sort of rampant corruption. Love that guy. And there's this there's this always this refrain about not looking backwards. But no, we are trying to figure out how to prevent our government from being co-opted in the future. And the way we do that is by having <laughs> absolutely, uh, uh, you know, proctology level invasive interrogations of Jared Kushner's mm-hmm. finances. Yeah, you well, I mean? I mean, Jared Jared did a bunch of favors for the Saudis and got $2 billion. But the other, the other part of the quid pro quo for Jared is like, hey, give me this money now because, you know, my dad might be back in there, so I'll take care of you later. Right, so that's, like, it's, it's yeah. ongoing. But it's, it's hard to understate the madness that's happening in state capitals like i know look at massachusetts back back to the point about how we're not you know there's not a bunch of bill welds running around winning primaries in massachusetts the governor is charlie baker the most popular governor in america 74 percent approval rating he's not running for a third term because he could not get his own nomination really at the party convention this weekend it went to a guy named jeffrey deal who's a trump person Corey lewandowski works for him like typical Fox News MAGA guy. He wants to deploy uh, the National Guard to the border because that's what we do in Massachusetts. The border of New Hampshire? The, the, <laughs> the, the Republican <laughs> Secretary of State candidate said the following at the party's convention. This is a quote from the Boston Globe. This is her. I don't think it's nice when they're telling your five-year-old that he can, parens, perform a sex act on another five-year-old, she said, drawing gas from the audience. Do you? Uh, this person is trying to distort all these sort of conversation we've been having about curriculum and sex ed in school in Florida to suggesting that teachers are teaching kids to have sex with each other. This is the secretary of state candidate in Massachusetts. Seems like she's not going to win. I don't know, man. No, it's Massachusetts. Charlie uh, Baker, uh, though, didn't even you, go to the party you convention. Put her, you put her in Arizona or Michigan. Who's the, as an, uh, popular who's the name of the person? I have a joke, but I can't remember. Who's the name of the person? Martha that, Coakley? Yeah, hold on. Oh, no, she's running against Martha Coakley. <laughs> <laughs> That still stings. 
Yeah. But it's just like, you know, Charlie Baker, 74% approval rating, can't get the nomination to run for a third term in Massachusetts. Yeah. Because he's a Trump critic. The presenting sponsor of this episode of Pod Save America is Simply Safe Home Security. You know we love the break-in protection that our Simply Safe Home Security system gives us, but it's not always outside forces you need Simply Safe's protection from. Tommy, you're now well versed in Joshua's story, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. You remember the pizza rolls? They were in the oven. Uh, almost burned down the house. Simply Safe saved the day. Joshua's alive today because of Simply Safe. Thank God. Our friend John Lovett also has a Simply Safe. He set it up himself, no problems. He uh, updates it from his phone. Yeah. He locks the house, arms the house, does everything. And, he, and it's safe. You got to keep, I mean, if it's good enough to keep Pundit safe, it's good enough to keep you safe. One stop safety shop. Protecting people when their guard is down is just one of the reasons more than 4 million people use and love Simply Safe. With a comprehensive Simply Safe system and 24 7 professional monitoring, you always have someone looking out for you. Plans cost under a dollar a day with no long term contracts or hidden fees ever. You can customize the perfect system for your home in just a few minutes at simplysafe.com slash crooked. Go today and claim a free indoor security camera plus 20% off with interactive monitoring. Go to simplysafe.com slash crooked. Pod Save America is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. You know, Tommy, certain people just make my life so much easier. Like me? You were, I, I was going to say you. It says riff, so. It says it says friend, partner, co-host, really all the above. Whenever it says riff, <laughs> I assume it's the time to talk about me. Mm-hmm. It's like if you own a growing business and need to hire, ZipRecruiter makes hiring so much easier because they do the work for you. And right now you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash crooked. ZipRecruiter uses its powerful technology to find and match the right candidates up with your job. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. No wonder ZipRecruiter is the number one rated hiring site based on G2 satisfaction ratings as of January 1st, 2022. In fact, the hardest thing you have to do is remember our special URL. What is it? ZipRecruiter.com slash crooked. That's where you go to try ZipRecruiter for free. One more time, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash, in case you'd like this kind of thing spelled out. I do. C-R-O-O-K-E-D. So there's two O's. Two O's and crooked. ZipRecruiter is the smartest way to hire. Pod Save America is brought to you by Tommy John. When the heat waves hello, say goodbye to a hot, sweaty undercarriage in your cool new Tommy Johns. It doesn't even make sense. They have a lot of gross words in here. <laughs> I actually think undercarriage Me is too. the worst one yet. Me too. What the f*** is an undercarriage? Um, yeah. It made me, for some reason, it made me kind of think of like Bridgerton and getting driven around in a horse-drawn carriage. Yeah, that's, yeah, I don't. You don't want to get under one of those things. When you wear Tommy John, Wouldn't you're that much hurt. <laughs> when you wear Tommy John, you're that much cooler. So you can do everything better much thanks cooler. to breathable, lightweight fabric with four times the stretching of competing brands. Four times the stretch of competing brands. Uh, let Sorry. me tell you, you 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 need the right level of stretch too, because there's too little stretch right when your sock falls down and drives you crazy. But there's I have some boxers that are like too tight stretch. Uh, they're not Tommy John. They're, they're old, just like crappy ones. Snapping. Your, well, you're just like ow. That, you, no one needs that. No. With dozens of comfort innovations, Tommy John will keep you looking and feeling cool all season long from lounging at home to summertime fun. That's why Tommy John doesn't have customers. They got fanatics. With over 17 million pairs sold, people love their Tommy John underwear and loungewear, including us. We've been wearing it forever. You know, not just their underwear, but their loungewear. It's really comfortable Tommy John pants, like sweatpants kind of thing, but they're thin. They're mm -hmm. great. You should just check them out. They're comfy. Yeah. Tommy John doesn't just make you feel cooler. You actually are cooler. Stay up to seven degrees cooler than cotton and Tommy John's Apollo underwear. Plus, there's no risk because you're covered with Tommy John's best pair you'll ever wear or it's free guarantee. Shop TommyJohn.com slash crooked right now for 20% off your first order. Get 20% off right now at TommyJohn.com slash crooked. TommyJohn.com slash crooked. See site for details. Let's talk about the Democratic side in Georgia. Uh, thanks to Republican gerrymandering, there's a competitive primary between Representatives Lucy McBath and Carolyn Bordeaux, uh, who've been drawn into the same district. Other than that, uh, Stacey Abrams will once again be the Democratic nominee for governor, and Senator Raphael Warnock will try to hold his seat against a challenge from Herschel Walker. Uh, and even though they will be facing a brutal political environment, uh, here is a hopeful piece of data from a Washington Post story about how early voting in Georgia is surging despite Kemp's voter suppression law. Quote, by the end of Friday, the final day of early in-person voting, nearly 800,000 Georgians had cast ballots, more than three times the number in 2018, and higher even than in 2020, a presidential primary. Um, so the piece also, of course, has Republicans accusing Democrats of, quote, hyping accusations of voter suppression and saying that these turnout numbers prove that the rhetoric around the law was false. What do you guys think? Tommy, was it false? I just don't think <laughs> we know yet. 
Yeah. You know, we, we, we're not going to know the real impact of these laws until after the primary election day when we have, you know, like precinct level data and, and absentee ballot rejection rates. And then again, we'll have another look after the general election. But I mean, you know, the Abrams campaign put out a memo, Lauren Growargo, uh, her campaign manager, said that 45% of total Democratic primary turnout to date didn't vote in 2018. 11% of the vote didn't vote in the general election in 18. So they're bringing in a bunch of new voters. That's amazing. That's exciting. Um, but she pointed out that, you know, there is a lot of like seemingly efforts to scold Democrats for raising awareness about this law. First of all, the voter suppression law changed because we all screamed about it. That's like the key point that seems to be getting lost. They in... stripped out the worst provisions and they yes. didn't strip them up out of the goodness of their heart. No, right. It, it was <laughs> yeah, because of political yeah. pressure and fear of corporations. Yeah, and, and like losing the all-star Georgia. game and everything else. Um, but she also mentioned that we, uh, Lauren Gowargo, uh, Abrams campaign manager, said, we already know that mail ballot rejection rates are higher than they were in previous elections. So that's worrisome. And then there's a voter in Forsyth County who has challenged the eligibility of 13,000 other voters in one county. So there's a lot of weird stuff happening that has to play out. Well, so here's the... <laughs> I think it's this is... Simpler than it's made out to be. Like, two things can be true. Like, Trumpy Republicans tried to make it harder for people to vote with this law. That was their intention. But because they're getting out organized, it's not working and people are voting anyway. Like, th both of those things can be true. <laughs> yeah. And again, like, creating a bunch of barriers to voting based on a entirely manufactured claim of electoral fraud can be overcome by people who know the barriers are there and so come with ladders and uh, come with galoshes and other shoes to get over the moat. But, like... You just still dug a moat for no fucking reason to make it harder to vote. Yeah, and look, and out organized. Look, I do think they're getting out organized. I think like Democrats on the ground in Georgia are doing amazing work. But there's a less complimentary version of it where you know voters are just really worried that if they mail in their ballot or they wait, that it'll get struck or thrown out, or if they try to vote absentee, so they're voting in person early. Yeah, well, also out I of mean, fear of this law, mail-in voting has plummeted since 2020 in Georgia. But it's still higher than what it was in 2018, which strongly suggests it's just because people weren't comfortable voting at the height of the pandemic. And so right. even the mail stuff is just it's just go, it's actually not going back to what it was before the pandemic. It's still higher than what it was. It's just people don't want to people don't want to mail in their ballot. They want to show up in person because that's what Georgians have always done. That's what most people have always done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know, um, and you know and I do think even the Forsyth <laughs> County ex uh, example is basically what I was saying with keeping these two truths in mind at once, which is like. This fucking person challenged 13,000 voter registrations in Forsyth County. and But because of organizers and the hard work they've done, only a handful of those challenges of 13,000 were successful. So it's like, now, should a whole bunch of organizers have to do all this extra fucking work and put more money and time into fighting this voter suppression law? No, it's outrageous that they did. But I think the only point that people should keep in mind is... This isn't the end. Like, you should not be discouraged by these voter suppression laws into saying, I might as well not try anymore. Because in, in Georgia, where 95% of eligible voters are now registered, thanks in part to Stacey Abrams and all of these groups on the ground, like, people can out-organize these laws. It is possible. I do think the, the one big flag, though, is um, primary voters uh, in both Democratic and Republican primaries always tend to be the most engaged yes. and therefore the most likely to vote no matter what obstacle you throw in their way. Yeah. And I think the key is what happens in the general. And that's where a lot of these groups on the ground have their work cut out for them. But just don't ever let yourself think that because a voter suppression law was passed in a state that that's it. And it's not worth trying because clearly in Georgia, they're showing that they can overcome. The this. reason to not try is because the legislature will invalidate the election entirely. OK, yeah, yeah. Don't, no, no, <laughs> no. Oh, that wasn't the point. That's you not just, the point. Not, now I'm sad. <laughs> All right. If you squint really hard at some new polls from uh, CBS and Marist. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you put the screen on the other side of the room. You get it. You squint. You put on a strobe light. And then what do you see? Well, you see some glimmers of hope for Democrats. <laughs> uh, so even though Joe Biden's approval is at 39 percent in the Marist poll, that Love. ain't great. Uh, the survey also shows the Democrats are up 47 to 42 percent of the generic ballot, an increase in eight points from last month's poll. It also shows that 66 percent of Democrats say the draft Supreme Court decision overturning Roe makes them more likely to vote in November compared to just 40 percent of Republicans. The CBS poll shows that only 35 percent of voters want Roe overturned. And in that poll, more voters have an unfavorable unfavorable view of the Republican Party than the Democratic Party. 54% uh, of voters in that poll describe Republicans as extreme, the word extreme, more than any other word uh, given to them. And 51% 
described the party as hateful. That was the second <laughs> the second most common word to describe the Republican Party. For Democrats, of course, the top word was weak. Came and coming in at 51%. Um, so forget about what these polls may predict or not predict. We're not going to do that. Do these numbers tell you guys anything about what Democratic candidates should be talking about in their ads and on the campaign trail? Um, so I think, like, these... Let's just be honest. These numbers, Biden's approval rating is is quite low, mm-hmm. and it's quite worrisome, yeah. and it, it's nerve wracking. I think one of the numbers that really popped out from, I believe, the CBS poll was that I think eighty nine or ninety percent of voters in both parties are most concerned about inflation. So I do think that will be, you know, the driving issue for a lot of voters. There is increasing evidence that the Republican Party's incredibly extreme position on eliminating abortion rights and this potential ruling from the Supreme Court could be the type of issue that clarifies the contrast between Republicans and Democrats in a way that really turns out voters. There's the Marist poll you mentioned, there's the CBS poll you mentioned, but then the director of polling at the Harvard Kennedy Center did an op-ed a couple of weeks back in the New York Times where he talked about how in focus groups with young voters, this draft opinion uh, from the Supreme Court on abortion rights has the potential to motivate younger voters the way Parkland did in 18 and the way George Floyd's murder did in 2020. So um there is some hope here that there are some issues on the table that could really fire democrats up i do think it's challenging with um the economic news really dominating what people are hearing i remember when we were in the run-up to 2020 we talked a lot about the coalition of basically pro-science people that wanted a better response to the pandemic that wanted that was pro-vaccine that was pro-public health measures uh, that was against the chaos they were seeing coming out of the Trump administration. And that was a coalition that was broader uh, than than Democrats and broader in the kind of independence we need and the moderates we need without us giving up anything. And I do think that choice is that, that issue now, that abortion access is that issue now. There is a very, very big coalition of people. Uh, there is no state in the country uh, that wants Roe uh, overturned. And if we can make everything seen through the lens of of reproductive health care, of access to abortion, of choice. I think that that is something that can, I mean, look, we needed something to change everything. This is something that changes everything. Like I don't tell everyone, you know, vote pro-choice up and down the ballot, vote for the candidates that are in favor of Roe. That's it. Every, and then everything can flow into that. I was Well, that's, that's the part that I think is important because I think that, that Roe is probably the central issue that is Um, salient enough for people and that people know the most about because everyone's heard about the draft, let alone what happens when the Supreme Court actually hands down the decision. But I think there is a there is increasing evidence in this in all these polls that Republican extremism is the one thing that could keep Mm -hmm. the Democratic coalition that turned out in 2018 and 2020 together. Uh, I am now doing a bunch of interviews and focus groups for the next season of The Wilderness, which we just announced will be out in September. But I was struck by, I talked to a, a, a Democratic strategist who was maybe the one strategist in 2020 that when all the polls were showing that <clears throat> Democrats were comfortably ahead, kept sending out these updates that said it was going to be much closer. The polls were wrong. He was like very dark about it. And I asked him about 2022 and he was actually more optimistic about 2022 only because he said, if the Democrats do this, he's like, there's there's a coalition of Democrats that turned out in 2018 that sort of like shattered all midterm turnout records. And what happened was there's people who usually only vote in a presidential race, but they showed up in 2018 to vote in the midterms. Those people, if you can bring them out in 2022, the people who usually just vote in presidentials but voted in 2018, then Democrats can keep it much closer than it we think it's going to be right now. And the way to turn them out is to make sure they know that the threat from Trumpism is not over and that Republicans are, they're coming after Roe. They are coming after, some of them are coming after gay marriage. Some of them are coming after fucking birth control. A Trump endorsed candidate in Michigan says she would vote to ban all birth control. All birth control. comes off her vote. Already, because, I, I, quote, sex no. ought to be between one man and one woman in the confines of marriage. There is a, Fuck off. There you is a crazy person. sitting United States senator from Indiana who is on video saying that the Supreme Court should leave the decision about interracial marriage to the states. What are we doing? Half the Republican caucus in the House just voted against funding to help with the baby formula shortage. Uh, like we- Melissa Murray in the Times today talked about how quickly this can lead to bans on contraception. It isn't perspective to a lot of these right wingers who are extreme on abortion. They consider contraception like IUDs to be abortion. 
and they are already banning it or trying to ban it or making it impossible uh, for people to get access to the care that they need. So it's already happening. They've already moved on to trying to ban contraception. Well, in-house Republicans in Louisiana made an effort at drafting a law that would have uh, made abortion homicide. And so that it, it's, you know, and the Marist poll shows that two thirds of Americans do not support overturning Roe and that Democrats are more likely to turn out in the election because of what they learned about that draft opinion. But, you know, there are even more extreme cases that we can lift up and highlight as a party the way Republicans lift up every extreme case on the left all the time, always, and act like that is representative. And all I can say is our job and our work is to never forget to lift up the specific examples. Do not take the shortcut because we're all in our echo chamber. We all talk to each other of just saying that Republicans are extreme and leaving it at that. Find the stories in the states where you have all of these extreme Republican candidates proposing these very, very extreme policies. Because if you just say they're far to the right of their extreme, people aren't going to know what you're talking about. And they're not just going to assume that you're correct. Like the Democrats just have to do a better job of lifting up these examples. Um, all right. When we come back, John Lovett interviews L.A. mayoral candidate. Karen Bass grills Karen Bass. Yeah, yeah. Then we're going to head down to the grill for some Cheesecake Factory. <laughs> Pod Save America is brought to you by AG1. What if I told you you could get 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens in a single scoop of mythical green powder? I would be over the moon. And you'd tell me, John, you idiot. That's what I have every day. I have a scoop of AG1. Why are you, why are you asking me about this Why for? am I so mean to you in your head? I don't know. I don't know. I just say this ad all the time feel like everyone should know by now that fantasy can become reality with AG1. Tommy's been on it for uh, years now, it seems like. Uh, yeah, uh, AG1 is my Belco, you know, <laughs> and that's why I've been performing at peak. You, yeah, I've noticed that your performance is just a little more peak than usual lately. Yeah, it's honestly unfair to the competition. <laughs> Doesn't taste like a shot of wheatgrass, which again, I guess is the worst thing you could uh, consume according to AG1. Big grass lobby. They got a great mild tropical taste at AG1. Uh, you're going to look forward to. It doesn't give you the jitter- jitterness of jitteriness of coffee. See, I've had so much coffee I can't even say the word jitteriness. You're high as a kite. Um, that's why I should have had my AG1 this morning. It's recommended by professional athletes and with over 7,000 five-star reviews. This is high nutritional value in its most convenient format. Health potions and power-ups don't exist in real life, but AG1 feels as close as you can get. It'll energize you, keep you regular, always important, and tastes great. <laughs> It's also completely adaptable to your particular lifestyle. Keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, gluten-free, whatever you want, they got you covered. It's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition, especially heading into the flu and cold season. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills or supplementals like your grandma used to take. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and Five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash crooked. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash crooked to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Pod Save America is brought to you by Magic Spoon. Since starting to incorporate Magic Spoon into my daily morning routine, I've noticed fewer cravings throughout the day and more energy to hold me over until lunch. Also, I've just noticed that I eat Magic Spoon more. That's what I've yeah. really noticed. Since since incorporating into my life, I can't get enough of it. But I do think the more proteiny breakfasts kind of work longer. I've always yeah, keep you it, keep you full longer. Singing to the choir here. Yeah, zero grams of sugar, thirteen to fourteen grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving. Honey Nut flavor does have one gram of sugar. Uh, only 140 calories a serving. It's keto friendly, gluten free, grain free, soy free, and low carb. You can build your own box. Available flavors to build your very own custom bundle are cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, cookies, and cream, maple waffle, blueberry, cinnamon, plus the newly reformulated Honey Nut flavor that will now be added to Magic Spoon's permanent collection. Congrats to Honey Nut. Go to magicspoon.com slash crooked to grab a custom bundle of cereal. Be sure to use our promo code crooked to check out to save $5 off your order. Magic Spoon's so confident in their product, it's back with 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they will refund your money, no questions asked. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash crooked and use the code crooked to save $5 off. Thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this episode. Pod Save America is brought to you by Imperfect Foods. Combating climate change feels big and overwhelming. What can one person by themselves do? Actually, there's an easy and delicious way to make an impact. Imperfect Foods. You want to fix climate change? Buy ugly vegetables. Ugly veggies. That's it. It's delicious. Imperfect Foods is a grocery delivery service offering an entire line of sustainable groceries that taste delicious and reduced waste. 
just by embracing the natural imperfections in food. So they say it, they say it nicely, natural imperfections. Right. They really mean, I guess that's just us. That's really mean. It's just, just us, but it's just, the, it's just the vegetables. That's what you should know. It, that's why it's so silly that these vegetables could somehow get thrown away because it's just, just because they're ugly, you're going to throw them away. They're perfectly good vegetables. Yeah. I ate a, a zucchini that looked like a naked mole rat. And um, I bet it was, I bet it was delicious. Ugliest thing I've ever seen. Tasted incredible. Visit imperfectfoods.com to see if they deliver in your area. Once you sign up, you can personalize your weekly grocery order with fresh seasonal produce, pantry staples, and yummy snacks. Plus, your order will arrive the same day each week, making it easy to build a stress-free routine. On average, Imperfect Foods customers save six to eight pounds of food with every order. And unlike on-demand delivery companies, Imperfect delivers weekly by neighborhood a unique model that produces 25 to 75% fewer emissions than individual trips to the grocery store. Isn't that nice? Yeah. Um, So yeah, we love, we love imperfect foods. Once you chop it all up, it all looks the same anyway. What what you're, when you're, when you're going for some beautiful tomato, what you're really getting is uh, the experience of taking out of the fridge, looking at it once, then you chop it up anyway. And when you're eating it now, you can realize, man, I just, I, I reduced waste. I am helping to save the, uh, the planet which is a lot more than you can say right now for Joe Manchin. Yeah, you know? sure. Or, or any Republican politician. Speaking of someone I want to throw tomatoes at. <laughs> is that a pivot? Yeah, that's perfect. Right now, Imperfect Foods is offering our listeners 20% off your first four orders when you go to imperfectfoods.com and use promo code CROOKED. Again, 20% off your first four orders. That's up to an $80 value at imperfectfoods.com when you use promo code CROOKED. Join the movement at imperfectfoods.com and use the code CROOKED. Joining us in studio, the representative from the 37th District of California and a candidate for mayor of the city of Los Angeles, Congresswoman Karen Bass. Welcome back to the pod. Thank you. Thanks for having me on again. So you want to be mayor of the city? Yeah. You can't even get a decent slice of pizza. I know. <laughs> It'll all be fixed. It'll all be fixed. Yeah. Wait, so what, why are you running for mayor? Really on the serious side, <clears throat> because Los Angeles is really in a terrible crisis. Uh, a lot of different cities are dealing with homelessness, the unhoused. But in Los Angeles, when the count comes back, we anticipate it being more than 50,000 people on the streets, in tents, in cars, in RVs. And I believe it is a public health and a public safety emergency and needs to be treated as such. So we're in this home stretch. And a lot, as you said, a lot of the dynamics playing out in the race are being experienced by cities across the country, questions around crime and the housing crisis. Your opponent is a wealthy business person. He was Republican who registered as a Democrat to run. He's dropped a million dollars. Two weeks before. Two weeks before. Mm -hmm. It was a very important two weeks for him. Mm -hmm. He learned a lot. Exactly. Uh, Changed all the values. (laughs) He also dropped a million dollars to support a pro-choice initiative to make up for having been donating. He committed a million. He committed a million. hundred thousand. Okay. Okay. See, this is why. This is good. This is good. (laughs) This is good. But uh, uh, he's been a Republican his whole life. At the same time, he spent tens of millions of dollars blanketing the airwaves in L.A. with advertisements to frame frame the choice in the race a certain way. How do you frame the choice in this race? Oh, I frame the choice as whether Los Angeles is, go, is going to go in a direction that is more conservative, is going to take a turn to the right, is going to reach back into the past with old, tired policies that do not solve problems, or whether we're going to continue moving in the direction of an inclusive city, of a liberal city, of a city that embraces everyone, and a city that comes together to address the problems. I'm very concerned, and one of the big reasons why I made the decision not to run for Congress again. You know, after experiencing four years of the Trump administration and the way Trump tore this country apart, we're still suffering from it. I think if we learned anything in those four years, we better learn that we can't take anything for granted. And just because this is an overwhelmingly democratic city, it doesn't mean we can't slip and make a turn to the right. I don't want to see that happen. So there's two pieces of this. One is just making sure everybody turns out, right? And nobody takes this for granted. But there's also uh, a city that is seeing tons of these ads that is worried about crime, that is worried about uh, uh, um, unhoused people, both because they view it as... uh, um, a public safety issue for their families. And also yes. plenty of people want this to be a just and safe place. They want there to be enough housing. What do you say to people who still feel undecided right now because uh, they're they're progressive, they're Democrats, but they're seeing these ads and they're just thinking, well, this is a person who says they're just going to fix it. 
I'm going to hand them the keys and they're going to fix it. Well, we have been there before. We've been there, done that. Mm -hmm. And a strong man is not going to solve the problems. One who has never been in the public sector. He has been a, a wealthy businessman his entire life. He inherited wealth. And um, I think you have to look at it from the perspective of he has run a company, never had a board of directors, never had shareholders. This is not an autocracy. This is a democracy. And I don't believe that a person coming in like that can solve our problems. Now, the whole world watched us experiment with this. Do we really want to do this again? And in California, you know, as, around, as well as around the country, there have been numerous attempts where billionaires and millionaires run. I think there's somebody who's not in the White House right now who spent $1 billion in 30 days. So yes, of course, the ads are troubling, but I would just ask people to look below the surface. Where has this person been? If you're worth $4.3 billion, why is it that you never have built one unit of affordable housing in all that time? How is it that you've paid $1.6 million in taxes over five years, but yet you won't show your taxes? So this is a movie we've seen before. I don't want to see it happen again in our city. You have to admit, it's pretty, pretty smart to inherit money. That's a good idea. Oh, hey, I'm not mad at him. <laughs> I'm not mad at him. I just think it's like, I think, it's, I think it'd be cool. Well, He's I hope smart, I have some know? money to leave my kids. <laughs> but <laughs> so uh, that is around how, you know, people who have run as business people have defined what it means to be a leader. But I want to hear from, rather than defined against what kind of he's offering, what is your view on the role of the mayor, someone who's been in public service uh, for decades, who kind of sees this from the, not from a kind of business angle, but from like how you bring people together. How do you view the role of mayor uh, in terms of not just being one person solving problems, but getting oh, getting coalitions together? Well, you know, uh, first of all, I've spent most of my life not in public office. I've spent most of my life as a social justice activist, building organizations, building coalitions. That's one of the things that I have done for decades, bringing people together across geography, ideology, race, class, and that is what is needed to solve the problems. I do not believe that politicians alone can solve problems. To make our democracy really work, we need people to participate. That's what an organizer does. I served as Speaker of the House in uh, Sacramento uh, for two years during the worst recession since the Great Depression. And the only way California got through that was by bringing the entire legislature together to the table to say, you know what, we all have to make these bad decisions but that's what we need to do in order to prevent the state from defaulting. Do you think the L.A. mayor should be more powerful? Like, I, I hear what you're saying that we need, you know, this idea of one person can fix a problem that's been tried. doesn't work. But at the same time, you know, I see Nithya talking about the fact that uh, taking a citywide crisis like homelessness and dividing it up by district sometimes doesn't, does, work. doesn't work. No, nope. uh, You know, uh, there have been confusion and COVID protocols between the county and the city. Sometimes it's felt like Barbara Ferrer is more powerful than elected officials. The The mayor isn't in charge of the schools. Do you think that the L.A. That, that LA's mayor should have more power to solve some of these problems? Well, you know, I'm not sure if the mayor needs more power, but what I do know is that you can use the power you have and then you can take power. You can take charge. It's a question as to how you lead. And you know, uh, the job is what you make it. And so you just touched on one of the fundamental areas of dysfunction in this era, in this region, and that is the gap between the city and the county. We will not solve the problem of the unhoused if the city and the county cannot work together hand in glove. I have worked with the county for a number of years on the issues I've worked on. The five supervisors, I know each of them personally very well. So one thing that I bring to the table that I don't believe my opponent does are deep relationships on every level of government. And it's going to take a whole of government, federal, state, county, and city, to work together to address this emergency. And on this question of the the homelessness crisis being addressed district by district, what would change if more of that if that power wasn't devolved to the to the city council members? Well, I actually think that the problem is not going to be addressed until we address it countywide. So I just was speaking to the function between the city and the county, but we have to take a regional approach. So when I said over fifty thousand people who are unhoused, I was just referring to the city. If if we talk about the county, it's probably another 20. But, you know, we're all waiting for the count since it hasn't been done for two years. The numbers should be coming out in the next month or so. And and that would 
But then, so, okay, there's the difference between addressing at the county level and at the city level. But then there's also this, you know, you read between the lines and you feel like certain city council members are take a different kind of approach than others. That's, some 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 push the problem around, some try to just get them right. out of their area. Right. That can't be solved at the county level. Well, no, but that's why I say we need a countywide strategy and a citywide strategy yeah. as well. I don't like the council by council approach at all because you know what's going to happen? It's pretty easy. The, in the people that are unhoused in the affluent areas are going to be moved into the low-income areas if we don't solve the problem. And if we take the tack of, look, just get it out of my sight. I don't really care what happens. But again, that's why we have to have an entirely different approach. We have to get people off the streets immediately, but we also have to address why were they on the streets to begin with. And if you don't mind, can I just take one second to describe the population? Yeah. Because right now, people are being viewed all the same. They're all drug addicts who don't want to come inside. And you have multiple uh, categories of folks. There are people who are just economically unhoused, people who are working full time, living in their cars or their RVs or in tents. You have former foster youth who turn 18 or 21, and we as a society just kick them to the curb because we cut them off of everything. You have veterans. You have people who were formerly incarcerated. When we downsized the prison system, we didn't think about where people were going to go. And then you have people who are suffering from chronic diseases like substance abuse and mental illness or other diseases. We have to have strategies to address each and every category of person that is unhoused. And until we have a comprehensive approach like that, we're just going to be dabbling at the problem. So we talk about two aspects of that. I think one is just access to housing. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. and It's not enough. Not enough. So there's both... You just talk a little bit about what you view your role as mayor would be both in terms sure. of just building a ton more housing and then mm-hmm. also targeted affordable mm-hmm. housing for people even at moments of crisis. Well, let me just say, yes, building the housing, but working hand in glove with the county so that the people, the minute they get the key to the door, they're also getting services. If we just put people in the house without addressing what drove them outside to begin with, they're not going to stay in the house very long. So I think that that's critical. Now, overall, we have a a problem, I believe, the root problem in L.A. is profound income inequality. The gap between the rich and the poor is massive and the middle class disappearing. The city has become unaffordable. So we have to build 500,000 units of housing and a significant percentage of those need to be affordable. But I would really question when people say affordable, affordable to who? Right. So that's going to be really important. We just need, but we need tons of it. We need like a 500,000. Ma- uh, and then one other piece of this is what happens when people are on the precipice of, of homelessness? Thank you. They're, Thank they're, you. They're, they have, they have, they're living in their cars. I mean, sometimes the government isn't, isn't, is not only not helping them, government is part of the problem, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. People being ticketed, pe- cars yeah. being impounded, right? That, like, at That's the right. moment of crisis, right when they could be helped, right. they, are, they are sort of punished for their economic situation. What can the mayor do? You know, day one, what could you do to help those people that are right on the edge? Well, one is that you stop ticketing cars when you are obvious people are living in them because then you're going to wind up towing that car. And and, and that's that's ridiculous. What I would do on day one, though, is declare a state of emergency and push the governor to declare a federal state of emergency. The bottom line is, is that you are absolutely right. We're not going to solve this problem if we do not address the thousands of people that could become homeless any day. We have to make sure that those people that are still housed, I'm not talking about in cars, those people that are still housed stay there. And so that's gonna need rental assistance right now because we're still not out of the consequences of this pandemic. So one thing you've talked about is bringing mayors uh, from other cities together Mm -hmm. uh, because this is a problem that is sort of growing in a lot of different cities. Mm -hmm. What would that do and how do you think about, like on the one hand, people just want the mayor to solve this problem. And they don't want to hear excuses that, oh, this is happening everywhere. But on the other hand, this is a city dealing with a national... Right. Trend. How do you how do you well, think well, about that? Well, the point of bringing the other mayors together is to go to Washington to say that this is a emergency. Yeah. This is the richest country in the history of the world. How can we have people sleeping on the street? I mean, we've grown to accept this. And I there is an entire generation that has grown up thinking this is normal. I remember when we didn't use the term homelessness. That's new. That's new meaning from from like the eighties, which is when this problem actually started. Now there's always been a handful of people, okay? who were unhoused, but extremely rare. This problem took off in the mid 80s. And even if you build 
five hundred thousand. You're not going to be able to build five hundred thousand units no. overnight. We are making no, up no, for no. decades right. of a failure to build. More broadly, one critic, one one criticism of the way Democrats have governed in California yeah. is we've just made it really hard to build. We've made mm-hmm. it hard to build schools. That's made right. it hard to build parks. Made it hard to build. Uh, 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 infrastructure. We can't get a train Correct. from from San Francisco to Los Angeles. Are there ways in which you would want to cut red tape and just make it easier to build in the city? Yeah, you just said it right there. I would cut red tape and make it easier <laughs> to build. But you know, the way that I would do that, though, is by centralizing a lot of the functions and fast forwarding it. So for example, you know, there's 88 cities, by the way, in LA County, and you can go to an adjacent city and have no problem building. It's L.A. that is the problem, and it is the problem because of the massive bureaucracy and because there's so many departments you have to go through if you want to build something. To me, anybody that comes to me and says that they want to build housing to address the unhoused or they want to build affordable housing, I don't want them to go to the front of the line. I want them to have their own line, and I want the departments to be centralized. I want them to have access to bridge funding because that's one of the problems, too. The financing takes so long that it winds up increasing the cost. And so the way that you can deal with that is dealing with the red tape and also providing people loans so that while they're going through the process, they can build quicker and then pay it back when the public money finally kicks in. Do you think it's crazy that we can't build a train from uh, San Francisco to Los Angeles? Oh, let me just tell you something about that. I don't get when it. I, when I was speaker, one of the things I was very proud of was getting the high-speed rail on the ballot. That yeah. was legislation that put it on the ballot, and I was so excited. We're so behind the world. France, Japan. I mean, everybody has high-speed rail. Why, but, like, the the state voted to do it. We passed it, right? The public voted. The, pa- the public. Right. The public voted to pass it, voted yes. for this to happen. Yes. And uh, Jerry Brown wanted it to happen. <clears throat> it's supposed to go from San Francisco to Los Angeles. And next thing we know, now I'm building a train from, from Merced to Bakersfield. I mean, that's <laughs> a great route. Nowhere, Why right? we go, what, what are we well, doing there? Well, what, what, who needs high-speed rail from Merced look, to Bakersfield? Look, when I uh, got the legislation <laughs> on the ballot, that was 14 years ago. 14 years ago. What and the gonna... first leg was supposed to be L.A. Orange County. All right. Why, well, why can't we build that? Can you build that as mayor? Who's no, going to build it? I can't. Well, what are we going to do? <laughs> can, why can't continue. Gavin build it? Well, we'll have to call him up. You'll have to have him on the show. This is frustrating to me. <laughs> uh, I wanted to just sort of step back because I think a lot of people are hearing this. They're not in Los Angeles, but this is something that in terms of the story that is being told about our politics right now, you are running in a city that is worried about crime and, and worried about uh, unhoused people at a time in which the right wing has villainized uh, Democrats blamed progressive politics, right. blamed progressive DAs, uh, uh, blamed liberals for creating this crisis. And I think sometimes even in Los Angeles, that narrative has a lot of power for people. So how do you talk about uh, the progressive vision for addressing these issues in a way that's humane and just without giving into some of these sort of right wing stories? So I couldn't have said it better. You just explained every reason why I'm running. Because to me, I could see the writing on the wall. I was flashing back to the 1990s when we went through, we were exasperated then too, because it was the Crips and the Bloods, thousand homicides, crack cocaine, AIDS, all of these problems converged, not everywhere in the city like the unhoused, but in certain areas like South LA. At the time I was on the faculty at USC Medical School, I walked away from that job to go to the heart of South Central to start an organization to address these problems because the only solution politicians had were to pass sentencing laws. And so my concern is is that to where we are right now, the stage is set to repeat that. And because we basically as Americans are, we have an ahistorical culture, we don't look to history as a guide. When, when I see what is happening right now, I think the stage is set for us to move in that punitive direction, which might make people feel good because those homeless folks will be off their block. But if we just lock them up, they're going to be out in three days and they'll just move to another area. And so what I'm doing in terms of uh, my vision is to fight for the problem to be addressed in a comprehensive manner, to talk about the root causes, the reasons why people are unhoused, to fight for those services that we stripped away in the 90s while we were locking everybody up, and and to understand from history 
that we really should not repeat this. Now, we do have a problem with crime. We have to address crime. And progressives can't run from that. If we yeah. say, well, it's not as bad as it was in the 1990s, but if your house was broken into, you have a crime crisis. We have to face it. And we have to say that if somebody commits a crime, they have to be held accountable. Now, at the same time, I'm going to invest time, money, and resources in crime prevention strategies that we pioneered back in the 90s when I was running community coalitions. Those strategies were professionalized, researched, and replicated. We know how to prevent these problems. We just never invest in it. So what you're going to find from my administration is I'm going to address crime head on, but I'm going to dive into uh, addressing the crime, stopping the crimes of today, but preventing the crimes of tomorrow by addressing those communities and dealing with the problems before they reach the point of criminal activity. Do you feel like there, this, there's been, obviously there's this fight between you and Rick Caruso, but there's also this intra-left debate about uh, about how to answer uh, right. what Republicans are saying. And I think mm-hmm. you're offering one uh, uh, vision for how to respond, right? It's, it's uh, uh, acknowledging, recognizing, uh, uh, the fear people have and talking about some of the ways you would address it, both in terms of policing and also in terms of broader reforms. Do you worry at all about the critique you're getting from the left uh, for um, uh, what you said about um, police, uh, about hiring police officers, about hiring police officers? Well, I mean, you know, no, no one wants everybody wants a kumbaya. But I, I understand that criticism. But I will tell you, it's the same criticism I received in 1990. When I said to the left at the time, crack cocaine is a problem. It's not okay. We can't just look away. This is having devastating impact in communities. And what people wanted to talk about then was the CIA's involvement in bringing cocaine into the country. Now, we knew that was factual. Senator Kerry at the time did a congressional uh, uh, commission looking at the CIA's involvement in that. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. The whole, oh, okay, but people were dying in South Central. I understand they were involved in CIA, but but I think that our side sometimes has a hard time dealing with some of the social problems. And, you know, you can talk about root causes of which I believe in fighting and pursuing. But if somebody's being shot at, what's your answer? So I think you have to address crime because let me just tell you this. If we don't address crime, if we don't have a response, then we've conciliated it to the left. I mean, to the right. We've just handed it to them. We don't have a response, so you do it. And what happens when that, when, when we hand it over to them? We got mass incarceration. I mean, I watched this happen in the 90s, and it, and it was so frustrating because during that time, you know, I had no power, no position, no agency. We didn't even have social justice nonprofits, okay? That was a new phenomenon that started in the 90s. We had to create all of that. And so here I am, fast forward to now. Now I'm in this whole different position, That's why I had to come to this decision. I wasn't ready to leave Congress. I mean, what I will really miss about Congress the most is that I was able to do international work and domestic work at the same time. Taco Tuesdays. (laughs) Taco (laughs) Tuesdays. My focus was Africa, (laughs) actually. And uh, and so but but I but I walked away from that. And, And if this was about my quote unquote career, I would have stayed in Congress and run for a leadership position. It's never been about that. That's not how I've made decisions. When I walked away in 1990, I had a cush teaching job on the faculty at the medical school. I could have stayed there. But what drove me to walk away from that and go to the heart of South Central was that I felt like black folks were going by the wayside. I mean, we didn't use the term mass incarceration at the time, but we saw it happening. We saw the laws changing and we didn't have the power to stop it. Now I'm in an entirely different position. So that's what compelled me to come back. Congresswoman Karen Bass, thank you so much for being here. Uh, We are recording this Monday. Uh, which we may put out a clip saying this is your last day to register, but otherwise uh, everybody got a ballot in the mail. The election, the last day to vote is June 7th. You need to vote now. You can go to KarenBass.com. We need volunteers. We're having people phone banking, walking precincts, do it the grassroots way because the way I want to win is by building a grassroots coalition that all around the city with all of the rainbows that are reflected in our city, all of the diversity, to build a movement that says it's not enough just to get elected to some someone to get elected to office. Then we have to help them govern, help them lead. Should we go canvas at the Grove? 
<laughs> no. No, we can't. Hand out some food from the Cheesecake Factory. I think it's a good I idea. Don't think that Make some trouble, no? All right. Well, good trouble. It's my idea. It wasn't your idea. I can still do it. You can canvas. <laughs> thank you so much for being here. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you to Karen Bass for joining us today. And uh, we'll talk to you later. Bye, everyone. Check out the Crooked Store. Our Memorial Day weekend sale is here. Did you guys know we were having a Memorial Day weekend sale? I did not until. Well, it looks like we are. Until you just said that. This (laughs) Tuesday, May 24th through Tuesday, May 31st, you can get 15% off site-wide and up to 80% off new sale items. It's our biggest sale ever. It's our biggest sale ever. (laughs) Five years. Biggest sale ever. Uh, Also, we have a very exciting launch coming up that our marketing department has asked us to tease Mm -hmm. in a vague but clever and entertaining way. Mission accomplished. Love it. I think you got it. That was it. That was it. That's a good tease. I think for a Memorial Day sale, you technically need one of those things that kind of inflates and dances. Yeah, like like an Uncle Sam. Is that what they're called? Well, no, no, no. Like an Uncle Sam version of. Oh, sure. Memorial Day. What are those things called? I just equate Memorial Day with uh, car dealers. What are those things called? Us right now, like you idiots, you couldn't think of it. Anyway, well, we're stupid. You all know what we're talking about. Um, And anyway, just think about the tease though. Something's coming. Something's coming. D from Always Sunny. acts like one in an episode. It's very funny.